Hi, you're listening to the Psychopharmacology Institute podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Wagdan Rashad, and this is the show that aims to help you, the mental health clinician, stay sharp on Psychopharm. We hope you are in good health and spirits, psych heroes. Today's episode is about a case that one of our dedicated psych resident listeners sent in for us. So shout out to Dr. Cameron Fariba for sharing this vignette. Thank you. This case is about a young man, 14 years old, diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and presents to the emergency room with agitation. We have Dr. Gonzalo Laje to answer our questions. Dr. Laje is a child and adolescent psychiatrist in Chevy Chase, Maryland. All right, let's get to it. This is going to be an interesting discussion. So this young man is brought into the emergency room with his mother, and she reported that he's been deteriorating for the past year. But today in particular, he has shown a lot of aggressive outbursts, and she is concerned. He was controlled previously on risperidone, and he did develop some undesirable side effects like gynecomastia and dystonia. And also the pharmacology did not help resolve the behavioral symptoms. So they switched to aripiprazole, and at some point, after he started refusing oral medications. So with this intro, how would we approach something like this in the ER? So the first point about this case, and I really want to thank uh, the resident that sent it in, is that this picture is happening in almost every ER across the country, right? And the problem is not just the the teenagers, it's a 14-year-old, but it also happens with adults. So we have a patient that is on the autism spectrum. You know, it could vary how far down the spectrum they are. They may be nonverbal. Of course, that makes things significantly more complicated. But there's this picture of agitation, probably going with increasing aggression, which is usually the line that when crossed, patients are brought to the ER. And we are then in this crunch almost like, okay, what do we do with these patients? First problem is, do you have a bed? And most of the time, you don't. So a lot of the patients are sitting in ERs for very long periods of time. I mean, a week, two weeks. That's a crazy amount of time to be in the ER, particularly for these patients. So we can look at this problem in sort of many different angles, right? One would be the pharmacological angle, but that's not the only angle. And actually, arguably, not even the most important one. Environment is, in my mind, what is most important. Sometimes we can identify in the patient's history, again, adults and teenagers and younger kids, a disruption in their routine. Kids and adults on the spectrum thrive on routine. So something was amiss, something went wrong and is off, right? There's a a provider that uh, is not there anymore. They had uh, an activity that is gone. You know, something happened, right? And the routine is off and that starts to deteriorate things. The environment caregivers don't pick up on this early on. Things start to go fast. Okay, so just to summarize, the first consideration in understanding what might be the cause of this agitation is to realize that perhaps there's been some disruption to the routine. So we can ask about that. You mentioned pharmacology. What to think of there? So on the side, we have pharmacology, we have antipsychotics. We've used antipsychotics for aggression and autism. There's good data to show they work. But the problem is also people with autism tend to have, in my experience, by the way, side effects earlier. So the one that really concerns me the most in these situations is undiagnosed akathisia. So both SSRIs and antipsychotics can cause akathisia. And in patients that are either nonverbal or have very limited verbal communication, it's hard for them to tell you they're uncomfortable or to speak of the subjective aspects of akathisia. You have to really observe and you really have to pick up sort of this increased movement, this purposeless motion, and separate that from agitation in a way that if you suspect akathisia, you can go ahead and treat it. So generally, my approach is backwards. I say, well, we have akathisia until proven otherwise. 
And um, I start to think that way. And usually it helps sort of reframe things in a more uh, productive way to get to a better outcome. Great tip. So this aggressive behavior may, in fact, be the manifestations of akathisia. By the way, in the last episode, we reviewed a clinical trial called the BART trial that assessed to see whether risperidone or aripiprazole was better for irritability associated with ASD. I highly recommend you take a listen to it after this episode. Excellent. Back to Dr. Lache. Let me go back to the ER. So we have this patient, possibly acathetic, in the ER with history of aggression that we have nowhere to put him, right? No beds, no adolescent beds. The closest psych hospital with adolescent beds is miles away. They have a super long waiting list. Of course, you would have priority because you're in the ER, but there may be other patients in other ERs that would have similar problems. Now, you get your turn in line and you bring this patient to the psych unit. What happens to the psych unit? Is the psych unit even geared to take on a patient with autism? And most of the time, the answer to that is no, right? But we'll get back to psych units. What do you do in the ER with your 14-year-old on the spectrum who is aggressive at home and cannot be sent home? Of course, try to isolate the patient so you're minimizing lights, you're minimizing noise, you're minimizing sort of visual interactions or things that may be happening around. Any stimuli that you can reduce is going to help you. I mean, from dimming the lights to earplugs, to whatever you can do to minimize interactions with staff. So minimize the stimuli, that will help. And then try to create a routine for this patient. You know, it's hard to get an OT, it's hard to get a therapist in the ER to do any kind of activity with the patient there. You know, an art therapist. I know it's hard to do, but this should be the goal. This is going to make your life easier if you are the uh, CL psychiatrist or the psychiatrist covering the ER, or even if you are the ER doc, it's going to make your life a lot easier if you can engage the patient in activities and create that routine, you know, a wake-up time, a bedtime, meals. Try to get some, a little bit of exercise there, particularly as the kids are younger, getting those wiggles out will help. So create the environment, create the routine, decrease the stimuli. So just like Dr. Lahey said, reduce auditory and visual stimulation first. Then, as the days go on, get a routine established and include some activities to engage the patient in. Next up, we'll discuss pharmacology. And then we can think about meds, right? And when we think about meds here, of course, this particular patient was on risperidone. You know, risperidone, we have a, a lot of data in autism, so that was seemingly a very good choice. But over time, started to see kind of the bad things of risperidone coming out, you know, then switched to Abilify. So on that switch, we don't know what the timeline was, but probably Abilify made that akathisia worse. And when we are faced with a patient that has aggression, our normal instinct is to go up, right, on the antipsychotic, maybe some IM antipsychotic, you know, maybe some uh, haloperidol. And in essence, what we're doing is fueling the fire, making things worse for this patient. So my first suggestion is to get a really good history and a timeline on the use of antipsychotics, SSRIs too, and see where that agitation or akathisia started. And uh, oftentimes we can trace it back to higher doses or dose adjustments and go from there in terms of what you have. And maybe less is more, right? Maybe instead of increasing the antipsychotic or adjusting the SSRI, stopping it, reducing it, really trying to make an effort to back down may be more helpful than adding, right? So what are the options? Well, generally, benzos could help in the acute situation. Benzos can help even if you have a teenager, right? You're not sending them home on benzos, 
you're just using them for the acute phase, right? I mean, whatever concern you have about benzos, you have a patient that's definitely in an observed setting, most likely with a one-to-one and, you know, safety, at least from that perspective, is guaranteed. So regarding pharmacology, it is important to get a really good history and timeline of psychotropic use. And remember, instead of ramping up doses, perhaps it would be more beneficial to reduce or even stop medications. So let's have that in mind. So you mentioned benzos, Dr. Lahey. Which benzos would be best to start with? Great question. You know, the best benzo is the benzo that uh, the patient will take. Of course, you can always go IM and you could go with lorazepam in that case. So, you know, you don't have to wrestle or minimize the wrestling to use the uh, clonazepam multi-tabs. I find them to be sedating, easy to use. You get them in there. They're gone in no time. You know, this is what I usually recommend in an acute situation. But if the situation is acute enough, you're going to have to go IM and uh, Ativan or lorazepam would be the way to go. And what agents would you recommend for akathisia? Beta blockers can be very helpful in these situations. I'm not a huge fan of beta blockers in psychiatry, but this is the place where they have a really good role. So beta blockers can bring a lot to the table. My only concern when using beta blockers, or not my only, but my lead concern in these patients, is beta blockers will have an impact on melatonin. So evening beta blockers can suppress melatonin and therefore impact sleep. And uh, one thing that we know about patients in general, but certainly patients on the spectrum, is that they need to sleep well. If they sleep well, they're going to do much better the next day. If they don't sleep well, you will know. You will hear about it very, very quickly because their behavior is going to deteriorate fast. Ah, a great reminder about beta blockers. Actually, while researching this, a study found that patients who were on beta blockers for hypertension, mind you, improved on sleep when they were given melatonin supplementation. References are in the transcript. So to continue with this case, this young man was admitted and aripiprazole was augmented with quetiapine with minor improvements. Then a mood stabilizer was tried, carbamazepine to be more specific. That didn't really work. So they thought, okay, maybe carbamazepine was inducing the enzymes. So they switched to oxcarbazepine. Okay. And again, it's easy for me to sit here and second guess the clinicians that made the decisions to medicate this patient. The choice of carbamazepine for me is hard because we know that it induces metabolism of other drugs. We know it induces metabolism of its own. So it may be a solution for the short term, but not a great solution for the long term. Plus the insane interactions that you basically are exposing this patient to. So oxcarbazepine, it's certainly a better choice. And, you know, I'm guessing now that they did not pick something like lithium or valparate that we have more data on agitation and aggression because it was probably hard to get blood draws on this patient. So that's understandable and and a reasonable choice, I think. So with that, the patient showed less aggression. And so he was discharged on extended release aeropiprazole injection. And fast forward some weeks, he came back with worse behavior. What could explain this? The Abilify and certainly the Depot Abilify is a little different, right? Because in the context of what we've been talking about, you would generally basically predict that you would see this patient back, you know, in a few days or a few weeks because the agitation or akathisia may be driven by the antipsychotic. Ah. So he returned because the akathisia, most likely, could have returned. Interesting. Next up, we will discuss a little more on what else could explain this patient's symptoms and what to do about it. Observation is the most important aspect of an assessment. And one common issue that you may come to see, parents are more attuned to this because they've seen it before, is the presence of pain. 
So patients will not report the pain because they can't really give you that information, but they will be doing something. Classic issue, ear pain, right? Patients will be pulling at their ear, touching their ears, sticking their fingers in their ear. That's something to immediately consider and assess as a possible cause of pain. The compounding problem in kids with autism or adults with autism is that they have a very high threshold for pain. So when you find this pain, it's more likely than not that you will have a mega infection there, that you will have probably even a fracture somewhere, that you would have an advanced condition that is driving that pain. So your average patient on the other side of ER would be, you know, bending over in pain with a comparable issue, right? You're not going to see that in patients with autism. They have a very high threshold for pain and they can tolerate crazy amounts of pain. So pain is not an early indicator in these patients, particularly because a lot of the time they cannot articulate it. And again, good observation of the patient will give you clues to where things may be, you know, lack of movement of a limb or uh, funny posturing. Again, things that you have to assess. Of course, you know, they could have dystonic reactions. They could have other painful antipsychotic related issues. But I think the astute clinician would spend time with these patients, not just run on the history and observe, be with a patient in the room, clearly not by yourself, but be with a patient in the room to observe if you can pick up clues of what those possible sources of pain may be. Then, of course, you get full labs. You want to make sure that if there's anything there to pick up with your uh, chemistry panel, with your CBC, with your enzymes, you know, you want to see it, you want to know about it. But this is not always easy. Sometimes drawing blood from an agitated patient is extremely hard. So let's just make sure, dear psych nerd, that we are closely observing the patient and pick up any hints that they might be in pain. And I found it particularly interesting when Dr. Lahi mentioned the very high threshold for pain in kids and adults with autism. When I did some reading into this, there were some interesting studies that suggested that the brain's initial processing of pain may be comparable to non-autistic individuals, but the cognitive and emotional evaluation of pain may not be. So there's a wide variety in pain perception in autistic patients, ranging from either hyper or hyposensitive to painful stimuli. This 14-year-old patient's mother reported that he had been irritable and aggressive for the past year now. Could this be somewhat related to puberty? I asked Dr. Lache. It's a good question. I don't know that puberty would make things worse in this context. As we all know, puberty is a complicated stage in life, right? Hormones really uh, mess things up, so to speak, in the brain. And the adjustment to puberty takes time in a normotypical kid. You know, puberty can bring a whole bunch of other challenges for kids on the spectrum. I don't know that puberty per se would exacerbate the situation here. But on the other hand, okay, puberty is a precipitating or an exacerbating factor. What do we do with it? Do we stop it? Of course we can't. I did ask our resident, Dr. Fariba, about social history, and the mother did mention that one year prior, probably around the time when he started with the behavioral exacerbation, he changed to a new therapist. Could this also fit under the disruption of his routine? Well, a year prior is a little long. You know, what could be a disruption is, or the beginning of a disruption is, yes, they lost the therapist and they never got any therapy after that. You know, depending on the type of therapy and the benefit that this particular patient was drawing from therapy, yes, that could be a significant loss. You know, we see an important variation in providers, right? So a good teacher would, you know, allow for a child to have a lower dose of stimulants. A good therapist or a good environmental routine would allow for a, a particular patient to require less medicine. So there is that factor, right? And it's not in many ways something that we can quantify or anticipate. 
you know, yes, to some extent you can assess the teacher and look at their background and experience. But at the end of the day, in most school systems, you get the teacher that you get. So then, I mean, this is kind of a, a bigger, larger problem for us in child psychiatry. We're faced with a decision to medicate a child because the teacher is struggling. Finally, what could we recommend to the patient's family? Oftentimes, we'll tell them things that they already know, but we have to uh, insist and in many ways try to understand what the barriers are to the implementation of these recommendations. Structure, 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 right? This is what you want to create on the psych unit. Sort of the same recommendations that we discussed for the ER should be true for the psych unit and uh, tell uh, the parents in situations like, um, you know, prolonged homebound situations or anything really for kids and adults on the spectrum is try to keep that environment predictable. Give it as much structure as you can, bedtime, wake up time, activities during the day, have a schedule where you have the week in advance, you present a day at a time to show exactly what's going to happen today and at what time. The flexibility, their ability to change on the fly, right? All of a sudden, we think it's a great idea to go do, you know, fill in the blank. That rarely works well with patients on the spectrum. Got it. So structure, structure, structure. We are nearing the end of our episode today. What an informative discussion this has been. Dr. Lache, what would be your take-home messages for us? Okay, so first one is observe the patient. So you can determine whether you have akathisia, you have pain, you have something else going on. We didn't dive into things like, uh, you know, trouble with caregivers, environmental things that may be triggering. But you have the patient in the ER, so those are gone. Then look at the medication regimen and think what could be going on that could be drug-induced. Then consider that less may be more. So it's not always increasing or adding, but also taking away can help in many of these situations or decreasing. Create the right environment. Any planning that you can put into that environment is going to pay off, right? So decrease any kind of stimuli and create that routine that we were talking about that you want to translate that to your ER, to your unit, and eventually to the parents. Again, probably they already have it, but when you inquire, when you go into details, Parents may have difficulties in implementing that schedule for different reasons, you know, absence of caregivers, work. I mean, there are 100 million possibilities of what's getting in the way of that particular schedule being implemented. But work with them to improve that. And then consider meds that would help you acutely, like benzos or beta blockers and potentially mood stabilizers for the longer run. Let me summarize. Observe closely, consider drug-induced causes, create a less stimulating environment, and consider meds in the acute setting like benzos or beta blockers. Great. Well, thank you for your invitation to discuss this case. As you can see, this is a very, very relevant case because of its frequency, right? It seemed like an oddball in the beginning, but this is happening everywhere all the time. And I'm sure our uh, ER colleagues would appreciate some help with these situations that they have every day. And they're busy with other things right now. Oh, yes, indeed. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Lache. And we hope to have another case discussion soon. This is only possible with your help, dear psych nerds. Please send in your challenging cases if you want to hear them being discussed on the podcast. And that's about it for today's episode. I know I've done a lot of summarizing already. But this podcast would not be complete without our key points. Observe for signs of pain that the patient might not be able to verbalize. In a patient with autism and agitation, consider drug-induced causes like akathisia. Start by reducing sensory stimulation and then establish a set routine and structure to the day. Consider short-term benzodiazepines or beta blockers. However, Keep in mind the effect of beta blockers on sleep. 
Do you want to brush up on some more of your psychoform knowledge? Check out our website for video lectures, audio updates, and more. Visit PI Updates and become a premium member already. We have a bunch of CMEs and essay credits for you to collect. If you're a premium member or a premium plus member and you refer a friend to join our platform, you will receive a $50 Amazon gift card. The following people participated in this episode. Dr. Flavia Guzman as a general editor, Andy Rode as an audio engineer, Pamela Gonzalez as a project manager, and myself, Dr. Wegdan Rashad as the host. We'd also like to thank Dr. Gonzalo Laje for being with us. Thank you for joining us in today's podcast. Until the next episode, goodbye. Goodbye.